My name's Joy Cowsey. I'm going to talk about some scrum butts. Um, I know in the latest guide it's not called scrum butts anymore, but I still want to talk about it because I think it's a really good way of explaining to people where they think they are and what they think they're doing and then what they really could be doing to make it right. So I'm going to talk about five minutes on myself. That's not really, so about three seconds. I've got a lot of experience in working with development teams as a developer, as a scrum master, software engineering manager, software development manager. I've also been a trainer and a consultant, so I've got a lot of background, but I'm still learning. Even after sort of 10, 15 years in Agile, I'm still learning, listening to blogs, listening to different people, attending conferences. You're always learning and you're always improving. Attitude changes everything. A lot of the presentations today have been about people learning, people uh, listening to what people are doing, listening to what other people are doing. And that's really what Agile is all about, is again, continuous learning, but being open to learning, being open to getting things wrong. You fail quickly, remember, with Agile, but you can do something about it. So I'm going to talk about t some of the top 10 scenarios. Is everybody right? Can everybody hear me? Can everybody see the screen? Is it big enough? <laughs> talking to different people, talking to different teams, what I was trying to do is get them to work in a better way for themselves. Not for me, not necessarily for the company, but for themselves. Because again, if a team's working better together, they're usually producing things better. They're usually working smarter, working harder, and actually producing quality. I don't know if people have seen this before, but that's the, the syntax for the scrum, but is the, I think I'm doing scrum, but something doesn't work, therefore I'm going to change it. So one of the examples there is we use scrum, but having a daily scrum every day is too much overhead. So we only have one per week. I think they've lost the daily bit there. Yeah. So the first one is talking about suppliers. Um, this, this lady I was talking to was saying that she'd started a project with a third party and she'd taken them on because they said they were agile, they were going through all the good processes. She thought, brilliant, you know, they'll, I'll be able to get involved, I'll be able to get feedback, I'll be able to tell them what's, uh, what I feel about the product as it's improving and incrementally getting there. No, they told us, we're agile, we don't have to plan, we don't have to give you documentation, we'll just deliver when we want to deliver. They were hiding behind the misinterpretation of the Agile Manifesto. So what, she, what I told her to do was to ask them, you know, where's your product backlog? When are your releases? What are you going to deliver? When are you going to deliver it? And get more involved, communicate. And she started to do that. And to be fair, they were actually working in an Agile way, but they didn't want to actually tell the company because they'd worked with other companies that hadn't understood it and didn't like it. So once they started communicating, they found that they were doing it not the proper way, but almost there. So they didn't have uh, releases they could give them. But once she asked for how long are your sprints, what will you be delivering at the end of a sprint, they started to come more into the agile mode as well. So it was, again, it was communication there. We used Scrum, but decided our own Scrum de definition. I think somebody said that earlier on. Because we thought we'd just take the best bits. Yeah, we'll just do, maybe do daily scrums. Don't need to do anything else. I'm sure it'll work for us. The, the framework is there for you to try and pick up on the basics. You do your training, you take the framework, and you try and work with it. You can adapt it later, but unless you think about where you're going and what you're doing, how do you know if you're going to get there? Yeah, they say that they, they don't need documentation and they don't need to plan because they don't want all these meetings. They will take too much time away from the development. But you do need to plan. I think it was Eisenhower that said, plans are useless, but planning is essential. How do you know if you're going to get where, where you're going to or when you get there if you haven't planned it? They change, obviously, but you still need to know where you're going. This is one that I've come across quite a few times uh, in the couple of companies I've worked in before I was a trainer as well, where they said, we've got a team of developers, they're going to develop, they go through the sprint planning sessions, they go through their daily scrums, at their sprint reviews, their customers test. So they'll hand over what they've developed to their test teams, and their test teams then run their own sprints. 
But as you can see by that cycle, it can take a long time. At the end of a sprint, you're not necessarily delivering anything that's working because you're passing it to test and there may be defects. And it will take two or three sprints before those defects come round. What I suggested them to do is to work together within one sprint with one product backlog. So the requirements that the de development team were passing over to the test team were the same. Put them together and work together within a sprint. You'll find that the work will come a lot quicker. You'll actually complete items. You won't have things hanging over at the end of a sprint. Okay? They tried that. And they then, although they didn't do as much work in the first couple of sprints, they actually completed items. And from then onwards, you know, things got better because they were working together rather than handing over. We use Scrum, but are following our old phases so that we know where we are. Yeah, we're doing analysis, and then we're doing design, then we're doing development, then we're doing test. Guess what? You're not sprinting, you're doing waterfall. But what you could do is, if you've got items that are ready to go into a sprint, try breaking them down, do a little bit of analysis and a little bit of design in the sprint and see how you get on. See if you can finish something, because they weren't delivering. They had something like a two to four week first sprint and then a four to six week second sprint. I think they had three lots of three week sprints for their development and then just one sprint at the end for test. And it didn't work. Okay. Take a slice. Look at what you've got to do. Think about what the minimum you need to deliver and see how long that will take to do. And see what you get at the end of that. Go through the process as the sprint planning, make sure you do your daily scrums, make sure you do your sprint reviews and your retrospectives, and you will be growing then. And again, it took a few sprints before they got used to it. Um, there were still complaints about too many meetings, so they did need people to sit with them at the meetings to make sure they were getting the most out of those meetings. But at least they'd started to go through the process again rather than being waterfall. We use Scrum, but we update our burn down chart every day even when we haven't completed something. So one of these statements in the manifesto, working software over comprehensive documentation, they haven't got working software. They're burning down their hours, and at the end of a sprint, it looks like they've done lots of hours, but they haven't actually completed everything. And they couldn't work out why. And it was having to point out to them that you burn down the time on a completed item, not only on part of it, so that you can see when things are working. You've got, you can see where your progress is. It's, it's motivating to know that you've completed something, you've put it behind you, and you don't have to focus on something else. Um, I think it was Powell that did the one where he asked half the audience to think of a number and put up the six statements. Because you were concentrated on one thing, you couldn't concentrate as well on the second one. And that's the same with when you've got five, ten different things all going on at once. You're not able to concentrate. So complete one item, Put it to one side, and you can forget about it. You can move on. You can focus on something else. This is another one I think they said earlier on about retrospectives. We're doing OK. Why do we need to do a retrospective? Why do we need to look at what we've done? We've, we've done everything we were supposed to do. What this team weren't looking at is how they were doing it. How could they improve if they weren't looking back at the work they'd done? So we, the first retrospective, I asked them to sit down, write everything out on post-it notes. There was no talking. They had 10 minutes. Um, and the scrum master was saying to me, there won't be anything. They don't, there's nothing wrong. And there were about 40 post-it notes that came out of that. Some of them were very similar, but they did have problems. They had problems with tools, resources. But the scrum master wasn't aware of that because nobody had said anything because they hadn't been having retrospectives. Yeah, this, these are just simple things, but they're worth doing. We use Scrum, but we don't like work on anything unless we've completely defined it. So we break down each story to one story point so that we can better estimate them. I know in the invest statements, small is good, but you can go too far. And if your planning sessions are taking longer than the time box, you're doing too much in it. There, you've got to gauge how much you need to know before you go on a sprint. If the team understand what they've got to do, how they've got to do it, and what they, where they're going, then go into the sprint. Things will change, yeah? There's not very often that we get through a sprint without something changed from the beginning, from when we planned it. It may only be small things that will change, but again, you might have spent too much time in your sprint planning session breaking this down, and half of it's not needed. So don't do too much. It's experience usually that tells you when you've got enough. 
Don't take too much into a sprint either. Again, that takes too long in sprint planning. We use Scrum, but we do not need a product type. What most people do in the teams is they've got the Scrum Master to make sure that the team are delivering and developing. But do they need a product owner? No, we've got our requirements. People have thrown the matters. Why do we need a product owner? Well, the product owner is there to help you deliver what the customer wants. They're there to actually hopefully be experiencing what the customer is expecting so that you've got somebody who's not a blocker. You've got somebody you can talk to straight away. You can give you an answer. You can give you the feedback you need on whether you're doing the right thing. That is the most important thing in Agile is delivering value to customers. You need somebody there who's experienced what the customer wants, who's stood away from the development part of it. Okay, and the product owner is that important person. I put this up at work and we had a lady who was Norwegian and she didn't know who Stallone was. Do people here recognise Judge Dredd? A few people, good. That's what this product owner was like in this company I was in. We're agile. Whenever we get any requirements, I can just take them to the team and they can do them. What do you mean you have to wait to the end of a sprint? I don't want to do that. I want you to do things now. You're flexible. One of the customers that we had were police, um, and they were in the middle of a project. It wasn't live. Um, they decided they wanted something um, changed about fixed penalty notice tickets when you stop people um, when they're driving too fast and you stop them. They wanted something changed on, on the product with that. So in the middle of a sprint, they turned around and said, we want you to do that now. Uh, if we do that, you do realize we have to abandon our sprint. We have to look at this new requirement. We have to refine it. We then have to replan the sprint. And then we'll start going again. And you've got another two weeks to wait. They said, yeah, 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 that's fine. That's fine. So at the end of two weeks, when they came back for the review, and we showed them through um, the work that we've done on the new, on the new requirement, what happened to the work you were doing in the first week? Well, we had to abandon that. We had to start again because you'd asked us to drop this. Oh, we didn't know you were going to do that. What, what, what would have happened if we did let you go? Well, you'd have had all of that, and in the next sprint, you'd have had this as well. So they didn't ask us again. It was understanding that it's not easy to drop everything, to take your focus off of something that you've planned and committed to do. You've got to give people the time to be able to do that. So they didn't ask us to abandon it again. We use Scrum, but we're developers, so we do not test. This is, again, something a lot of people come to me and say, I know we're supposed to be cross-skilled. Yeah, I know we're supposed to be able to do everything. But you know, as a, as a developer, why should I have to test? Well, what we're trying to do is get people engaged in lots of different areas of development. They don't all have to be experts in everything. But if you can support the team, work together as a team so that the team can trust that they're all going to be able to complete these items within the sprint, that's what we're, it's, sorry, that's what we're expecting you to do. We're not expecting you to test us to learn how to develop and developers to learn how to test properly. But if the scripts are written, then anyone can test. I've helped the team out with testing. Yeah, we've needed it. We're trying to get through things in the sprint. We're trying to be open and honest. We're trying to be able to rely on each other. So it's, it's not we're trying to get you to learn new skills. We're just trying to get you to help. So that was the top 10. Most of the time when I'm talking to people, when I'm going in and helping them, it's, it's, it's getting their belief that this can work. There, are, there is a framework. Take the framework. Work with that framework first to see how you get on with it. Then you'll know what doesn't work. You'll know what you need to change. But unless you work with that framework first, how do you know what's right and wrong for you? Above all, listen. Listen to what people are saying. Don't just listen with your, uh, your ears. Listen with your eyes as well. Look at them. When they're talking to you, what are they trying to say that they're not speaking? Yeah, try and do all of that. So you have people, you have your stakeholders, your users, your scrum team, your customers, management sometimes if you have to, and the agile values. Focus. We need to be able to focus. That's what the sprint backlog is about. We've decided within the next two, three, four week sprint, that's the work we're going to concentrate on. We don't want to have to change too much. Sometimes you have things like support that you have to think about. Somebody was saying earlier on, if you plan it in, 
If you think about it, you might get some support ideas. Plan in that time. Have some extra backlog items that you can pick up as you go along. Your focus has still not been lost. You've got to have the courage to turn around and say, I don't know what we're doing. I need more information. I need more help. I need to ask for help. Openness, transparency. Make sure that your, your scrum board, your burn downs are available to everybody so that they can see what you're doing. Commitment. Get the team committed. The more that they're working together, the more that they're relying on each other, the more that they can feel the support of everybody, the more committed they'll be. And respecting everybody. Uh, respect what people are doing, how they're doing it, how they work. We have people in the team that come in in the mornings, they've got to have at least three cups of coffee before it's worth speaking to them or they just shout at you. So it's, it's respecting the way people work as well. It's getting the team together, getting people to feel that they are part of a family. It's a bit twee, but you, yeah, to understand, I think somebody said earlier on, you are at work an awful long time of your life. Try and make it a little bit enjoyable. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone.